I'm Kenny. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> I'm going to pray. Father, this morning as we come to you, we just want to worship you. We want to celebrate you. And we do it corporately. We do it together. We need each other to do this journey. We need the encouragement. We need the support. We need the accountability. So God, I pray even just through the relationships that you use this morning to continue to deepen and grow relationships, to introduce us to new relationships, people that you're bringing into our lives. And I thank you for the people you bring into my life, Father. Help us to hear your heart and your voice and that your Holy Spirit would just move inside of us today. So God, fill us this morning. Amen. Don't forget to stay hydrated today. Lately, uh, I've been thinking about two words that, how two words can carry a lot of meaning behind them. There are a lot of common things like, you're hired. You hear that, that carries a lot of weight. There's a, that, that, those two words can change your life. Also, the words, you're fired, could do the same thing. Or maybe they're words that aren't spoken, but you know exactly what they are the second the red lights start to spin and it's pull over. Those two words can change your day. There's a lot of two-word phrases that can really start you down a different path of your day or even your life. Words like, she's cute, just friends, date night, long kiss, head spins, in love, marry me, I do, I'm pregnant, it's twins, <laughs> we're broke. <laughs> Two words can just change everything sometimes. And sometimes it can be, what's that? Oh, no. Oh, no. Sometimes it can be more than two words. Sometimes it's more. Like sometimes if you read a well-crafted book, like for me, one of the books uh, that I just love that is one of my favorite stories outside of the Bible is Les Miserables. But if you start going down this road, by the way, it's about 1,500 pages. It's an investment of your life. Uh, one of my favorite books. So it's something like that where you're reading this great literature and it gets you to think differently and it jumpstarts some things in your heart and in your mind. And, and, and it could also be large passages of the Bible where you're just reading and you're soaking it in and, and it changes how you see things. Sometimes it could be simple as... Maybe you're reading Reader's Digest and you go to the quotable quotes section, one of my favorite things, and there's just a quote that is so thought-provoking that you write it down in your journal. You're like, I'm going to kind of, I'm, I'm going to soak on this one for a while. But sometimes it can be as simple as two words that shape how you think and how it changes the direction of your life. In the, the Bible, it can be boiled down to a lot of two-word little phrases, things like God creates. Man falls, broken heart, unfailing love, relentless pursuit, Calvary's cross, empty tomb, sin defeated, by faith, forgiven forever, more than, press on, thank you. And I just kind of want to unpack the gospel, the good news, into two word phrases, and, and not just part of the good news, and I'm talking about the whole gospel. See, half the gospel is just amazing. Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says, Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to its own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Jesus downscaled. He became poor for our sakes, and he took our sin and punishment on himself, and he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Whoever puts their faith in him, whoever puts their trust in him would live forever in eternity with God. And that is amazing news right there. That is something that you and I, we can't do that on our own. And no amount of our own goodness can even bridge that gap between 
me and God because my sin has caused a damage in the relationship between God and I, and only the cross of Jesus can bridge that gap. And because he was willing to die for my sin, I can embrace that forgiveness through the cross so that when I die, I get to go to heaven. I'm like, yes, that is so good right there. That is amazing grace, and it's too good to be true, but that is only half the gospel. Christ did not come to earth just to live and to teach and then to die and be raised from the dead just so that I can go to heaven, though that is so incredible because I could not do that. What would be cool is if when I baptized, like we had five baptisms last week, and I'm so sorry if you got confused if Google sent you somewhere else. It sent some people the wrong direction. I'm so sorry. We had a great time. Uh, sorry you missed it. It was amazing. I'm so sorry. Patty was one. She somehow was in Skamakaway going, I don't know where this is. Wrong direction. Right house, wrong, wrong house. Uh, right address, wrong house, wrong direction. But if when I baptized people and they came out of the water, if suddenly they opened their eyes and they're in heaven, they're like, man, real paradise. And we were in a beautiful spot. That would be so cool. But most people, when they came up out of the water, they saw me standing there. <laughs> Consolation prize. And you're just like, you know, but, but if we were to come up when we're baptized, you're like, yep, still around, still have my same old problems, my same old life. I'm still living in the same old broken down body and sometimes this world is just not easy to navigate. When I fully surrendered my heart to Christ, and I mean, I finally think I, as best as I could, we'll say, was when I was 21, I realized, you know, to the best extent, I wanna give my heart to Jesus. When I embraced that gift of eternal life, I mean, I was just a kid, but then I turned 22, and then 30 and 35 and 45, and now I'm 53, and it has been such a good life. And there have been a lot of valleys and a lot of mountains. And it's been an incredible journey and a great challenge. And I've loved it. But the deal is we still have to live this life right here, right now. And maybe I know for many of you, this last year, there's been a lot of significant change in your heart and in your life where you've surrendered more and more of your life to Christ. Some of you for the first time. And you ask Jesus to be the forgiver of your sins. And when you ask Jesus to start leading your life, it was this feeling for many of you that you just shared that came over you when that happened. And there was this kind of freedom and a release. And you're able to take kind of this deep breath and go, man, I haven't been able to breathe this free in years. And there was a release as God started to do these amazing things in you to know that you've been forgiven and free. And it was just incredible. And then you go home to your family and the same problems, the same job, same financial struggles, the same temptations, all of it just staring me in the face. So that's where we come to the rest of the good news. The whole gospel. Jesus said, John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life right here, right now, and to have it to the full. And when Jesus talks about having life to the full, He's talking about a life that's not dependent on the circumstances of the things that are going on around us. He told us that in this life, it's going to be hard, and there are going to be things that we have to learn to navigate, but it's going to be a life that is going to flourish in the middle of the circumstances around us. It's a life that knows peace right in the middle of the chaos. It's a life that knows trust in the middle of uncertainty, and a life that knows hope right here in the middle of grief and a life that shows compassion in the middle of need, and a life that shines right in the middle of darkness around us. Jesus came to offer more than a resting place in heaven when we died, though that is amazing. He came to offer life right here, right now. He is life. He came not only so that we can know him when we die and have eternal life, but so that every single day that we are on this planet, no matter what circumstances are going to happen, no matter what things are going to be thrown in our way, in our path, right at us, that we would know that Jesus is enough for us. And that his life would be your life, the very life of the Son of God, not just doing life with us, but that he is in us, in you. And those are the two words right there that will change everything in your life. I don't know if you remember the old Gatorade commercials. 
where they used to play on, on TV where you have these athletes and they're sweating, they're working out and they're just going at it. And as they're sweating and crying, you've got these different colors just kind of coming out of their skin where these, you know, different flavors of Gatorade. And you had fierce melon and strawberry coming out of someone's armpits. And you had these sculpted athletes and these famous celebrities as, that as they're crying and bleeding, that's what's coming out of them. And do you remember the question they asked? Do you know what it was? Anyone? Is it in you? Do you remember that? Oh, you already have it up. All right. Is it in you? And every time I watch those commercials, man, it would fire me up. I'd be like, yeah, I want to do that. Is it in me? Yeah, it's in me. And I'd go out and start jogging, and I'd play racquetball, and I'd go throw, you know, shoot some hoops with my friends, and I'm like, yeah. And then i go, okay, maybe it's not really in me. <sighs> The same thing is true, trying to live a life of Christ. If you haven't experienced it already, you're going to discover that your old self did not come with a power source to live the way that God promised and ordained for you to live your life. We need help. We need help that is going to be beyond our self. Self Self-help cannot help. All self can do is kind of dig you into great, big, self-centered holes so that when we come to Christ in faith, he moves us and he saves us from our self to help our self become the me that I was meant to be, that he created me and you to be. So how does this life of Christ become real and true in us? I want to try and answer some of that today by looking at some passages in the Bible I want to give you. Three words that come alongside in you. I want to make sure that, first of all, we understand what has really transpired here. Colossians 1.12, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. We do not qualify ourselves. We come up short. But he has qualified us to share in this kingdom of light. Verse 13, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. A huge transaction has happened here where we have been rescued. We have been brought out of darkness and into the light, and it is all His doing, not ours. So cool. Back on October 13th, 2010, I don't know if you guys remember this in the news, but these 33 miners in northern Chile were rescued after spending more than two months underground. I don't know if you guys remember that, but there was this copper and gold mine that collapsed on August 5th, and they were trapped for 69 days, nearly half a mile underground until they were rescued. And the guys started coming out of this dark hole, and as they were coming up, uh, you know, the, the, the rescuers and the people that were coming out of the hole, they had these tears going down their face. And it was ex- it, you know, exciting as every single one came up. People were crying and hugging them, and it was as exciting to see the 33rd person come out of that hole as it was to see the first guy come out, and then the 10th guy, and the 15th guy, and the 25th guy. Every single guy, it was a celebration as they came out. And that is how God feels about you and me. It never gets old to him. Watching people get rescued. And these guys, when they came out, they were all given these sunglasses. I don't know if you remember that. These $450 Oakley glasses were put on them. And do you know why they had to wear those? Yeah. They had been in the dark so long, they thought it would damage their eyes. And it was going to take time for them to readjust. It was going to take them time to figure out how to live back in the light. And that started to get me thinking. That is the way it is with us. Before we got rescued, we spent a whole lot of time living in the darkness. And when we get rescued, sometimes it's really hard to adjust to the new life in light. And some habits are just harder to break. Right? And we find ourselves not wanting to surrender everything to God. And as stupid as it is, sometimes we just want to go back down to that darkness because as miserable as it was, and as it is, it's still even 20 years maybe I've been out of the light, 30 years I've been are out of the darkness and I've been living in the light, I sometimes still catch myself wanting to go back to that darkness because I'm still familiar with it. It's what we know. The temptation is just as strong to go back down there and to live in the dark. And I just want to remind you, we have been rescued from that. 
We've been rescued from the dominion of darkness, and we have been brought into the kingdom of the Son that he loves, into the kingdom of light. We've been taken out of death and sin and moved to the very person of Jesus Christ. We don't have to go back there. We can embrace the new life with Christ, and I know it's different, and I know it's challenging, and I know that old habits are hard to break. I also know that we are not left on our own in this new life. He is in you. Colossians 1.27. To them, those that have been rescued, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, and he's talking about the good news to everyone on this planet. The glorious riches of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, when it says the hope of glory, uh, you know, some people think, well, this means the hope of glory, meaning heaven, the hope that one day when I die. And I I think that could be a part of that. But I also believe he's talking about the hope for this life, the hope of a lifestyle, the hope of a change, the hope of a transformation, the hope of a different way of living that reflects the light of God and the glory of God, the hope of becoming God's best version of of who you have been created to be. Christ in you, the only hope for that kind of life. It's not me saying, all right, Kenny, let's just hunker down. Come on, you can do it better. Come on, Kenny. You know, we can do it. Let's try harder. Let's work harder. Let's really bear down this time. Come on, let's just grit our teeth. We're going to apply yourself. I can do it. The hope of me ever living this glorious God-honoring life is only going to be Christ in me. Two things happen here. God took me out of sin and darkness, and he put me into Jesus Christ. And if that wasn't enough, he took Jesus Christ, and he put Jesus inside of me. And when it says Christ in you, it can sound a little strange to some of us. I remember one of my kids, when they were little, they thought, so is it like Jesus sitting on my liver? I'm like, "Uh, uh, well, it's kind of hard to imagine that, Christ in us. But it's the supernatural presence of the Spirit of God that moves inside of us to help us navigate this life. And I'm talking the same Spirit who pursued you day after day after day trying to get you to see your need for God. And I'm talking about the same Spirit who put people in your path to model what a life of following Jesus would look like. And I'm talking about the the same people, it's the same God, the same love of God that brought others around you to embrace you and and that God fills you. And I'm talking about the same spirit who gently began to convict you of your sin and the same person, the personal need for a savior, the same spirit that when you surrendered your heart to Christ is the same one that is now living inside of you and moving and teaching and breathing and molding and shaping and prompting and leading you inside out every day, day in and day out of your life. And that is the hope of living the kind of life where Jesus says, life to the full. Two words that changed a lot for me. Ten years ago were the words, he's dead. That was when my dad died. And immediately something changed in me where I started to view how I was going to be as a dad differently. I uh, I had four small kids. It changed how I was going to be as a husband. It it changed how I viewed my life, honestly. His death made me want to be different than maybe how I had even been raised by my dad. I, I felt like my dad had been pretty uninvolved in many areas of my childhood activities and events, and it shaped, I want to be more involved with my kids. And I started to have to cut things out. And that was okay to cut things out because I wanted to be more involved. I wanted to be different. I wanted to be more tangible with my kids. I didn't always feel like I had a strong father figure growing up when I was a kid. So I did a lot of destructive things, searching for other men that might fill that void, fill that role of being a dad in my life. And it started to escalate as I progressed into my teenage years and even into my, my adulthood. And I actually used that as an excuse for many of the bad decisions that I was making. And it really helped me ultimately to dig deeper into my walk with God and learning to see God as my father. And I know that God is now my heavenly father and that he can mold me and help me in ways that my real father could never have done. And many of you, you know the similar journey. And you also know, many of you, that you can't do this journey on your own. Knowing that you have a heavenly father whose presence lives inside of you and that difference has shaped your life. Christ in you brings power. 
When Christ moves inside of your life, he brings the power that you need to live this new life. I don't know if you've ever gotten the remote control car uh, for Christmas, you know, where you're, where you're so excited and you're ripping open the presents and then those three words change everything. Not the words some assembly required, though those are three painful words. The, uh, you know, <laughs> that's a Christmas nightmare for any dad. But the three words that can shatter any kid's day, the day they open up that present is, yes. <sighs> that happened to me as a kid. And we... <laughs> My parents didn't store batteries. We had to wait, and then I didn't have any money. And then, uh, Without batteries, it's not going to be a good day. <laughs> I remember giving one of my kids a remote control car, and they felt like they're, you know, as they're ripping open the package, and they, they're so excited. Batteries were not included. I did the same thing to my kids. It's an accident, and I had to explain to them, you know, oh, I get it now. Santa's getting older. Uh, sometimes he forgets things. Uh, sometimes batteries just don't make it into the package. But the thing is, if it doesn't have a power source, it's just so frustrating. But you need to know this. The new gift of life that comes with Christ comes with a power source, and our Father did not forget the batteries he didn't forget them. He moves in. He brings the energy that we need, which is this kind of unending power source uh, to live the life. I want to read a little bit more out of Colossians that we didn't read. Verse 9, we continually ask God to fill you with knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you would have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. God is saying, do you want to experience greater endurance in your life? Do you want to experience more peace right here, right now, and patience in your life? Do you want to be filled with joy and gratitude? Because it's in you, power of God, in you, through his power. Let's read this next one together. It's in Ephesians 1.18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. It says that the same resurrection power is in you. The batteries are included. The power to make the right decisions. The power to forgive when you don't want to forgive or feel like you have the ability to forgive. And I'm talking about the power to walk away from temptation, the power to love your enemies, the power to let criticism kind of just bounce off of you, the power to, to say and do the right thing at the right time, and to, the power to love unconditionally, and the power to share fear and anxiety, just to, to stare the fear and the anxiety when it comes right in the face and still be able to move ahead with courage. The power to handle bad news because you have this deep-seated joy and confidence and faith that God is still in you and still with you. And the power to ride out a rough economy and trust God for your daily needs. And I'm talking about the power to love in ways you didn't actually think that you could love. It's the power to love the way... It's the power to love the way that you look even when the culture around us defines beauty differently. And I'm talking about the power to set healthy boundaries in your life. And that's the same power that blew the rock off the tomb and gave life to a dead man. That is in you. And I love that the, the way the message translates Romans chapter 8. It says this. It says, it stands to reason, doesn't it? That if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be alive as Christ's in you. Those two words change everything, and it gives you the power to live this life. Another word that comes with 
in you is in Colossians 2, 6 through 10. It says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, and you did that through faith, through grace, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you've been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And and the next word that helps us understand that Christ is in you, we are complete in him. You all have the fullness of God. You are complete in him. The other day I took my kids to Seaside. We played hooky from the summer. The summer routines that we had been in, kind of where we did nothing. So we, we decided, I packed my kids up, uh, three of them, and uh, we went down to Seaside. We just shot down there, went to the Nike outlet, got some shoes for my kids for school, and then we're like, let's go to the downtown area. And they had the carousel, and we got gelatos. And anyhow, you know, you have all these crazy shops that are totally touristy. It's awesome. While I was, we were looking around, there's this movie poster that had 100 of the best movie quotes of all time. I don't know if you've seen this poster, but it's by the American Film Institute. The number one movie quote of all time. Do you know what that is? Anyone? It's Gone with the Wind. I'll tell you that. I don't, you know, and we know the rest. Right, right. And then number two from The Godfather, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Some of the other top tens, you had Dorothy saying, Toto, I've got a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Dirty Harry, go ahead, make my day. Obi-Wan, may the force be with you, and I'll be back, you know, from the Terminator. Some of the best movie quotes of all time. I mean, it's just great. I just started going down the list, and I'm like, oh, this is so fun. My kids were like, we don't know any of these But what I'm waiting for is for the American Film Institute to come up with a poster with the top cheesiest lines of all time. Because I already know which one is my favorite or the one I hate the most. It's from Jerry Maguire. No, it's not show me the money. You complete me. That line drives me up the wall. You complete me. I hate that line. The older I get, And the more I experience life, the more I get angry at that line because I've watched too many people expect that from another imperfect, fallible human being. And when we start to expect other people to complete us, we're going to set up our relationship for huge disappointment and pain. I have a friend who's going through a divorce, and and I I can't imagine saying to them, so sorry, you're only half a person now. You know, I... Because you were complete, but not anymore. Uh, No! They're complete in Christ. And they know that they're complete in Christ. And as they're going through this devastating season in their life that they never dreamed would happen, Jesus will be with them, whispering over and over and over to them, you are of such great worth. You are a treasured child of the Most High God. You are complete in me. It's going to be okay, and I'm going to be with you through this. And, and we're going to get through this thing together as, in, as we transition. You don't need to look anywhere else to be completed because you have been completed in Christ. When Christ moved into your life, everything changed. Your thirst for satisfaction has been quenched. Your search for fulfillment uh, and, and purpose have been given. Your need for acceptance and significance and approval, that has been met And when... When Jesus moved in, he brings all of the love, all of the acceptance, all of the approval, all of the grace, all of the fullness of God, all of the need. We are complete only in him. 2 Peter 1.3, as we know Jesus better, it says his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life, everything that we need to live a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promise, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by the evil desires. He gave us a promise 
in the fullness of his own glory and goodness so that we can share in his divine nature. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't get these things on an installment plan. They don't just go on layaway until when you get your life right, then you get it. You know, maybe someday you can earn it. Maybe someday you'll deserve it. Thinking maybe God is going to be holding out on you. God is going to grow qualities in us like peace and patience and goodness and gentleness. He's going to grow them in us. But everything that we need to live this and, and lead a godly life, it's already inside of us because he's already growing and doing and moving inside of us. We have everything that we need to live this life. But sometimes we we kind of let these things in life block us from growing them. You have what it takes to grow. We just need to take time to find out what is getting in the way, because there are things that keep us from releasing the things that God has put inside of us. But everything that we need to lead a godly life has already been given us. It's like when you're born. When you're born, man, you got all the stuff in you. You got it. But that doesn't mean you're start going to run down the hallways and start skating you know, through the hospital halls. You're not going to go out and start driving a car. But as you grow... And you mature, you start to do these things. You learn these things. You find out what your abilities are. You find out what your skills are, what your, you know, as you mature, what your talents are. But everything that you need for being all that you were meant uniquely created by God, the potential is given to you at birth. It's already in you. And when we're born again, spiritually, we get all of this stuff. We receive everything that we need to do, the life that God intends for us to live, because God is in us. He is in you. So the third word, and the key to all this, and this is the hard one, to remain. Jesus told his followers, John 15, 4, stay joined to me, and I will stay joined to you, just as the branch cannot produce fruit unless it stays joined to the vine. You cannot produce produce fruit unless you stay joined to me. I am the vine and you are the branches, and if you stay joined to me and I stay joined to you, then you will produce lots of fruit, but you cannot do anything without me. Jesus was saying to his followers, and he says to you, and he says to me, do you want to live with power? Do you want to live with a sense of completeness and deep satisfaction? I want to live life that is full and to do that he says remain in me if you want that remain in me so i did a little word study on remain in me and it comes from the greek word mino which means to stay or dwell or to establish a permanent lease jesus saying i will live in you I'm going to. I'm going to remain in you. You remain in me. You live in me. Stay connected to me. Stay in the flow of the Spirit of God. Live in this constant awareness of the presence of God 24-7. Not just when you come to church and go, oh, that's right. That's right. I'm, oh, I'm a Christian, but the rest I'm, I'm, I'm disconnecting. No, it's like this is something that aware of the presence of God in our hearts and in our lives when we're not here, but being aware of it every single day of our life. John Ortberg said, the main measure of your devotion to God is not your devotional life, it's simply your life. We have one life. Every one of us. We only get one chance at this. We have, sometimes I tend or we can tend to compartmentalize where, you know, I've got my work life, I've got my, you know, my school life or my home life or, or I might, you know, and I've got my spiritual life. But that's not how it works. It's all just one life. And it's all spiritual, it's all life. And when I'm starting to realize that and I get into the flow of God and I'm choosing to remain in him through the day, I start to see my whole life as this opportunity to become fully alive to what God is doing in me and around me. And when I'm at my job and I have this attitude or you know, the right, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging and I've got the right attitude or maybe I go to a, a restaurant and I'm, I'm tipping my, my waitress or my waiter and I'm, 
I start to slow down or you know, I'm going to listen to my kids to the things that they're wanting to share with me and I actually give them focused attention or I'm bringing laughter to the walls of my house or I'm eating a meal with a deep gratitude and responding maybe to the request of my neighbor to take care of their dogs or you know, every single moment is a chance for me to remain in him to stay in the flow of the spirit of God as I'm relating and connecting to people all around me through the everyday things as I'm in the grocery store and I'm at the checkout counter The main measure of your devotion to God is not your devotional life. It's just simply your life. Remaining in him is a choice that we make every day to just stay in the flow of the spirit of God. And we choose daily to stay connected or to sever ourselves from the main vine. And I just want to ask you personally, because this is important. If your life is not producing much fruit... And really, only you know that. I could never know that. You will know that yourself. Could it be that you're not connected to the vine? Could it be that you have chosen to cut yourself off? Because that has been my personal experience. When I say, you know, thanks a lot, God, for rescuing me. Thanks for pulling me out of my stuff and getting me out of here. And then I... God saves me, and then I'm like, thanks, and then I'm, I move on without God. I, only I know when I have severed myself. Thing is, you can look like you're growing for a little while. That branch, it, it can only fake it for so long, but it, it's a tragic thing. But sometimes I don't even know that I'm dying for a while. C.S. Lewis made this observation. He said, when a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is growing worse, he understands his badness less and less. I am learning that when I remain in him, and when we stay in the flow of the Spirit of God, he shows us things that we still need to work on. And we live with this kind of an awareness of areas that I need to let go of and I need to not run to the darkness in. And when we live in the awareness of God, what he's changing, we start to rely and I am in dependence. God, I can't change this thing. I can't seem to let go of it. God, I really need you. I need that power. I need that. And when we cut ourselves off, when we jump into the flow, when we jump out of the flow of God's spirit, when we fail to recognize that he's living in us and we're on our own, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that he's no longer in us. It just means that we're choosing to, silence, choosing to silence the voice that's in us and we're choosing to distance ourselves and then our thinking, it's distorted and we start... We can't see all the ways that our behavior starts to hurt others around us and the people that are in our lives that God has given us. And and we don't even notice that we are actually, that I am actually shriveling up more and more and I'm dying on the inside and I don't always even, I'm not even always aware of it. And I start to die even faster and faster and faster. And the whole time Jesus is trying to pull me back saying, come on. Come on, Kenny, get back in the flow. Stay connected. Come on, lean into me. And for some people in this room, God is saying, that's what I've been doing in your heart and in your life. You've cut yourself off from me, and that's the reason your life is going the way that it is. Come on. Come on back. Come on back. Recognize that I am in you. Sometimes when we hear that voice inside of us, I, I just don't even want to hear it because I want to keep going the way I'm going. I want to keep doing what it is that I'm doing. And let's just get honest. Sometimes we say to God, <laughs> I want to continue that affair. I, I'm, I just want to keep on drinking. I, I'm, I don't want to forgive that person. God, you know how bad they hurt me. And I want to, I want to keep going and, 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 and I have to keep going because I feel like I'm in too deep now. You just need to be quiet, God, because I don't really want to hear it. And when we do that, we not only grieve the Spirit of God, when we silence the voice that's in us, not only do we start to trash God's grace and cheapen the sacrifice on the the cross, we're never going to grow. We will never become the person that God wants us to be. We're never going to be the people that we want to be. And I'll never experience that real life inside of me, the full life that Jesus came to give us. I feel like God has been telling me, Kenny, 
Do you want to know deep satisfaction with an intimate relationship with the creator of the world? <sighs> Follow me. Do, do you want a life of adventure? Follow me. Do you want a life that counts? Follow me. Do you want a life that breaks down the door of routine and boredom? Follow me. Do you want a life that touches other people for the heart of God? Follow me. Do you want a life that just brings confidence and deep satisfaction every day? Follow me. Come on. Stay in the flow. Remain in me because I am going to remain in you. I just want to challenge you this week that how to be... I want to challenge somehow, I don't even know how to do this, for you to be more open to recognize and aware of the presence of Christ in you. Maybe instead of praying to God this week, like, like God's somewhere out there, maybe distant in the universe, like I'm just throwing prayers up into the sky, maybe talking to him like he's actually in you. Like maybe you're doing life together every single day. And I know I still have a long way to go myself, but God has been changing me from the inside out. And when I hear those two words, in you, when I realize the, the, the radical concept that God moved in and brought all of this fullness to help me do this life, I start to sense more and more his promptings, and I begin to sense this voice of encouragement, and I begin to sense his conviction in my life to do it better the next day. And I know every single meeting that I go to and every single encounter, whether you know, it's, I'm going to the drive through at the bank and, and I'm talking to, to whoever wonderful woman is there or every conversation I'm going to have with people as I'm walking around town, I'm sitting at patty cakes or you know, every moment of the day, he's not just with me, he's in me. And in those moments when I'm tempted to walk back into the darkness, he says, Kenny, Kenny, come on, come on back. Don't do that. Slip on these shades. <laughs> See darkness for what it really is, and let's get walking back into the light. And he leads me into a different direction. He starts to lead me into truth, and he leads me into better decisions that I can start to make. So this week, when you're in one of those moments, and you're starting to walk the right direction, you say, like Jesus, he's really inside of you. Jesus, you're in me, and I trust right now that as I'm walking away from these things, these things that are really, they're screaming at me and they want me to come back. They want my attention. I'm walking away from that. Your power, God, you're promising your power that I can walk away from these things, that you're going to remain in me and I really need that energized. I really need that power. And Jesus, I just want to stay in your flow today. I don't want to go down that road anymore. I don't want to say anymore. I don't, I don't, I don't want to react that way anymore and say those things that I know I want to say. I could really just nail that person. I don't want to cave into this temptation anymore. I just need your help right now. Let's do this together. God, I really need you. And the amazing thing starts to then happen. You're going to start to have the power, and you're going to say, hey, look at me. I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually walking away. I'm walking away. Well, I mean, not, not me, Christ in me, helping me to walk away, but, but, but I didn't even know that I could do that because I've always tried to do it on my own. I never knew I had this power inside of me. I never knew I could stand up to temptation like this. I never knew I had the Son of God in me, so I'm going to start to change and walk His direction. And instead of Him following me, I'm going to follow Him, and I'm going to follow His lead. Christ in you. The hope of glory, and those two words change everything. I just want to close in prayer. Father, help bring this awareness, this, this, this not just a Sunday faith, but this everyday faith of, of learning to live life with you. Father, I pray your Holy Spirit just move in us. Be more active. Give us ears to hear you better, the words that you're saying, the encouragement. Father, I ask that when we cry out to you, that your Holy Spirit just move and flow and actually energize us. And then give me the courage, give us the courage to actually act on that. God, I know sometimes you've energized me and I still haven't followed you. Father, fill us this morning, fill us this week. Oh, I've been wandering through the desert 
You've seen a cloud in forever over me But I believe your rain is coming And I've been hanging on to high hopes Cause you're the one who's making dry bones come to life You're the light I put my trust in And every word you say is gonna come true You will lead me to the promised land And everything you said is gonna happen Even though I haven't seen it yet And I will build a boat in the sand Where they say it never rains And I will stand up in faith I'll do anything it takes with your wind in my sails Your love never fails or fades I build a boat in a desert place When the flood and the water starts to rise, yeah I ride the storm cause you got you by my side With your wind in my sails Your love never fails or fades I build a boat so let it rain You're the map and you're my compass You help me navigate the currents under me So take the lead and I surrender Yeah Every word you said is gonna come true You will lead me to the promised land and everything you said is gonna happen Even though I haven't seen it yet And I will build a boat in the sand Where they say it never rains And I will stand up in faith I'll do anything it takes With your wind in my sails Your love never fails or fades I'll build a boat in the desert place when the floods and the water starts to rise, yeah I'll ride the storm cause I got you by my side With your wind in my sails Your love never fails or fades I'll build the boat so let it rain Somebody with a hand that I could have helped when I just can't see 
past myself, Lord, help me be a little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love, and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus. Little less like you. Yeah, there's no denying I have changed. I've been saved from who I used to be. But even at my best, I must confess I still need help. Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped Somebody with a hand that I could have helped When I just can't see past myself Lord, help me be a little more like mercy A little more like grace A little more like kindness Goodness, love and faith A little more like patience little more like peace, little more like Jesus, little less like me. Oh, to feed the beggar on the street, love to be your hands and feet, freely give what I receive, Lord help me be. Wanna put you first above all else, love my neighbor as in the moments no one sees, Lord, help me be. Little more like mercy, little more like grace, little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith, little more like patience. Little more like peace, little more like Jesus, little less like me, little more like mercy, little more like grace, little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith, little more like patience, little more like little more like Jesus, a little less like me, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. like the sound of a symphony to my ears is like holy water on my skin dead man walking slave to sin I want to know about peace to the rain. 
change I don't want to use your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water, your forgiveness It's like sweet